The Utah Jazz might be about to pull off the best rebuild in NBA history. They are only one year removed from the Rudy Gobert trade, one year removed from the Donovan Mitchell trade, and a year removed from going from title hopeful every season through the last four to five years to now entering a complete reset. After many expected the Utah Jazz to be one of the worst teams in the NBA last season, they ended up spending some time as the one seed and at one point held records such as 10 and 3, 17 and 14, and 31 and 31. Far from records that are held from the worst team in the league. Lori Markinen ended up breaking out as an all NBA caliber player and rookie Walker Kessler proved to be the replacement for Rudy Gobert instantly. Fast forward to this offseason and the Jazz have added three more first round selections in stretch four rim protecting Taylor Hendricks, scoring guard Keontae George, and scoring wing Bryce Sensabaugh, while also adding John Collins for a bag of basketballs and some Jordans. Now a year into this rebuild and the Jazz could already be poised for a postseason appearance next year. So let's discuss some of the development that occurred last season, why they were able to have so much success and their great offseason and where that has put them in a position to potentially return to the postseason already only one year into their rebuild. Lori Markkinen is undisputedly the biggest reason why this rebuild has gone so well. It was expected that Colin Sexton was the big piece in the Donovan Mitchell trade. Lori Markkinen was looked at as a nice piece and maybe he could be a wing player for them. But it was not expected that he was going to be the star. It was not expected that he was going to be the centerpiece of the trade. And it certainly wasn't expected that he was going to become a future all-star for this Utah Jazz team and one of their core cornerstone pieces moving forward. But that is very much the case. He won most improved player, very much deservingly so. Had a career high in points, minutes, field goal attempts, field goal percentage, three-point attempts, free throw attempts, free throw percentage, and assists and now part of that was due to the opportunity part of that was just due to the fact that he was ridiculously good when you were posting a high in field goal percentage whilst on your most volume of her career whilst scoring over 25 points a night it was a very special season for Lauren Markinen over 25 a night 50% from the field 39% from three became a very 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 high level shot creator is someone that is a very good three-point shooter is still not great at creating a shot for others but is still continuing to improve in that area his handle has improved significantly this is a guy you have to look out for and pay attention to every single time he is on the court and has proven to be an elite tier offensive talent far and above what we saw from him at any point in Chicago and certainly an improvement from where he was last year in Cleveland and is certainly going to be a core part of this rebuild and a core part of this roster for the next few years. Walker Kessler, as mentioned, was the guy who stood out the most outside of Lori Markkinen last year, making first team all rookie, averaging over two blocks per game, shooting 72% from the field. He already looks like he is just as good, if not even slightly better than what Rudy Gobert was giving the Minnesota Timberwolves last year. He can be a bit of a play finisher. He can be a bit of a lob threat. He can get you some offensive rebounds and some putbacks from there. His offensive game is not overly refined, but it is very efficient. He knows how to do what he does well. And if he can add a little bit of a touch and the odd post move throughout his career, he's going to be a regular 15 and 10 type of guy in this league whilst averaging over two blocks per game. His frame at 7 foot with a 7 foot 4 wingspan makes him very difficult to deal with on the boards, very difficult to deal with when you're driving into him in the paint, and it's going to help anchor this Utah Jazz defense to probably a pretty high level as he continues to develop throughout the next few years. As previously mentioned, Colin Sexton was expected to be the biggest piece of the Donovan Mitchell trade, and... He wasn't terrible by any means last year. One could argue, especially from an efficiency standpoint, that it was one of, if not the best season of his career. Uh, the volume just wasn't there. His injuries were a concern. Of course, he was coming back off of a significant injury. He only ended up playing 48 games. 15 of those games were starts. 
but he still looked explosive post-injury. It doesn't look like he's taken a big decline in that department, which is good to see. And he shot over 50% from the field and 39% from three, which for someone who has had efficiency concerns in the past, was an encouraging sign to see. Now, again, given it was in smaller volume, the volume was much greater in Cleveland when he was struggling from an efficiency standpoint, but there was definitely some very positive signs last year from a guy coming off of a major injury. It's clear he has improved at least to a point his three-point shooting. He still has great explosiveness and is able to get to the rim at a very high rate. So there's a lot still to like here with Sexton. Whether he's the long-term point guard or not in Utah, that's probably a bit more in question still as he still hasn't really shown himself to be a great playmaker. 2.9 assists per game was his number last year, and that's pretty indicative of where Sexton has been at at this point in time in his career. He is much more of a scorer in a point guard's body than he is a true playmaking point guard, but there's still a lot to like here with Colin Sexton, and I'd imagine he becomes a bit more of a regular part of the Jazz's rotation this upcoming season as long as he can stay healthy. Oche Agbaji was the other of their two rookies last year that were acquired via the Rudy Gobert and Donovan Mitchell trades, and he had himself a solid season. It quietly went under the radar, but Oche Agbaji put some very promising pieces on the floor last year that showed he is going to have a solid future in the league. In his 22 starts and 59 games, he almost scored eight points a night. He shot 35.5% from three, and played some solid defense at times and showed that he's going to be able to compete on that end. He has enough length, especially for the two guard at that spot, to be able to compete very well and should end up being at least an average, and if not an above average, defender. He's probably not going to be a guy who has a ton of self-creation upside and is ever going to be one of your core pieces on your team, but he slots in as someone, whether it's off your bench or in your starting lineup at the two spot, should be able to give you some solid 3 and D minutes, and there is always a need for that in this league, and I'd imagine Oche Agbaji is going to do that role for a long time for this Utah Jazz team. The other player I want to mention for Utah from a development standpoint last year is Talon Horton Tucker. He's opted back into his player option for this season, and I'm very intrigued to see what the Jazz do with him from a role standpoint as we head into next season. He finally got some run as a point guard through the back end of last year, and it's arguably the best he's ever looked in the NBA. Now, I'm well on the record saying I didn't like him in LA because he is best on ball, and evidently he was not playing on ball in LA next to LeBron. He proved in Utah that from a scoring and playmaking standpoint, he should indeed be at the point guard position. Throughout the course of the season, he averaged over 10 points a night, averaged nearly four assists a night. Those numbers were significantly greater when at the point guard position and proved that he can be a solid passer. He can be a solid advantage creator and can get guys around him the ball in the right places at the right times. Now, efficiency was the biggest concern for him last year. He only shot about 42% from the field and again, didn't shoot great from three. But he's not that off-ball guy. He has great burst, great athleticism, he can get to the rim at will, and is showing that he has a very good ability to get guys around him involved in the offense. He ended up posting career highs in points, assists, rebounds, and free throw attempts, and that's indicative of where he is as a player right now. He has good athleticism to get on the glass, he has great athleticism to get to the rim and draw fouls, and he's continuing to improve as an on-ball creator for himself and for others. And I really hope that we get more on-ball play at the point guard spot for Taylor Horton Tucker this season, and it might really unlock his game, as well as who could potentially be Utah's future starting point guard, as that's the only position that's still a little bit in doubt as far as young guys on this team. In addition to this young talent on Utah's roster, we know Jordan Clarkson is back. He has got his extension. We mentioned the lack of youth at the guard position. For the Jazz right now, specifically at point guard, they have some tweeners. They have some guys who can play at the two. But Jordan Clarkson's, again, a bit of a tweener, but someone who can play some time at the one for them. Led them in scoring other than Laurie Markin last year with a bit over 20 points a night. He's going to continue to be important. Kelly Olenek is going to continue to be important and provide more spacing, provide good three-point shooting. And although not the best defensively, 
still is very long on what is going to be a very long front court when you consider Kessler, John Collins, who we'll mention briefly, and now Kelly Olynyk, and a drafted Taylor Hendricks. Taylor Hendricks was the first of three guys that was added in the draft this year for Utah, and I really, really like what he brings to the game in this modern NBA. He's going to bring a lot of value on both ends of the floor, and I'd imagine is able to make a pretty significant impact right away from day one. Uh, he has great upside as a three-point shooter, and similar to Kelly Olynyk last season, should be able to continue this base of the floor for the Jazz from the four position. Now, evidently, with Walker Kessler being such a paint force and being restricted to the paint on the offensive end at this point in time, having that spacing at the four is going to continue to be very important for Utah, and I have no doubts that Taylor Hendricks is going to be a very good three-point shooter at this level. Hendricks also has great defensive instincts and should end up developing into a great help side rim protector. Ultimately, it's going to mean Walker Kessler is going to get to sit in the paint and be a true five, can be a strong side defender, can be a post defender, can still help rim protect. But he's also going to have Taylor Hendricks long term on his weak side, on his backside, just swatting everything at the rim, being able to be a very high instinct help defender and alleviating a lot of this pressure off Walker Kessler in the paint that will allow this defense to be very, very good in terms of interior defense. The second selection from the Jazz was Keontae George, which is another one of those guys who's a bit of a tweener for them uh, in terms of whether he will be a shooting guard or, or a point guard is someone they might want to be a point guard at times because they need one, but it's certainly much more of a two. Uh, he has some shot selection and decision-making improvements that will need to be made, but he certainly has a good three-point shot, and especially if he could improve as an off-ball mover, could become a very good spacer and three-point shooter for this team at the two spot, and does have upside as a shot creator and tough shot maker. The biggest thing is going to be his efficiency and his decision making and he'll have to figure out his role on this team where there is a lot of guys already that are a bit of a mix between a point guard and a shooting guard but he certainly has some tantalizing upside that he could bring to this Utah roster. The third selection another exciting offensive talent and that was Bryce Sensabaugh of OSU. A great three-point shot is going to provide good wing spacing anytime he is on the court and does have some solid shot creation upside. The interesting thing for him is going to be his size and in turn his lack of speed and lateral quicks especially, especially in the defensive end is going to be the biggest concern for him moving forward. But if he can put it together a little bit on that end, the offense is really exciting in terms of his upside and we'll see what he's able to bring to this Utah team. Now the intriguing ad that wasn't really expected was the addition of John Collins for Rudy Gay and a second round pick. They got this man for nothing. He joins Utah with still two years left and a player option after severely underperforming during the last two years in Utah. Those two years being the first two years of his bag that he got after they made the Eastern Conference Finals. Now Collins has certainly not been as effective on this contract as he was during the third and fourth year of his career. He obviously hasn't performed up to expectations and that's why he got traded for a bag of chips. The notable concern is he's had a couple of injuries since those stronger years, those third and fourth seasons in the league. And most notably, his defense and his three-point shooting has really, really struggled compared to where it was a couple of years ago. Now, despite the injury concerns and despite the big contract, there's plenty of reasons to like this addition for the Utah Jazz. Firstly, the Jazz gave up a bag of balls to get him. It, it took nothing. All due respect to Rudy Gay, he's a vet on, at this point. He's just a locker room vet. And that's my guy, that's a Toronto Raptors legend. But at the end of the day, he's just not producing that much for you in the basketball court at this point. And a second round pick, when you've added five first round picks over the last two years, is simply just not that significant. This is a low risk move that took very little value to complete. The only risk is the contract. Now the reason I would say that the contract is not of significant concern is all of their first round picks or acquired first round picks, those being Walker Kessler, Ocek Badji, Taylor Hendricks, Keontae George, and Bryce Sensabaugh, none of them will have any potential future extensions kick in until after John Collins' contract is done. Meaning his contract does not significantly restrict the long-term future of the Jazz's rebuild financially, which is key. Because if they want to try and compete a little bit more right now by adding a John Collins, 
I am all for it. They've already added a lot of talent. They don't need to be at the bottom of the barrel right now to try and add a top three pick. The biggest thing is they can't restrict themselves long term and hamper their rebuild. They made sure that this trade does not do that. Now, whether John Collins is a long term piece of the Jazz's future remains to be seen. But given how little the Jazz had to give up to get him, all Utah need to do is make him comfortable in his new environment, help him get comfortable in a new role, and help him return to some of his former play that we saw him give a few years ago, and they could immediately flip him for greater future assets than they gave up for him. And remember, they only had to give up a second round pick. It won't take much to make a positive return for John Collins once they move off of him. Now, he might just stick around and become a core part of their future, in which case, bonus, you just traded a second round pick for a core piece of your team. But I would imagine he is flipped in a year or two for more than a second round pick, and then Taylor Hendricks, who you just took in the lottery, can be ready to start in the starting lineup right next to Walker Kessler, and will let the Jazz flourish with their future front court duo of Walker Kessler and Taylor Hendricks. And for the time being, John Collins just provides more depth for you in the front court. It lets Hendricks ease into the league a little bit more with less pressure, can come off of the bench and be their third big between him, Walker Kessler, and John Collins. And all at the same time, they'll get positive value out of John Collins in a trade in a year or two. Despite the big contract, there are so many reasons why the John Collins trade is a low-risk move with very high upside that could end up reaping many benefits for the Jazz over the next couple of years. Ultimately, as they head into the next season, the biggest thought that gets thrown around is the fact that they have a bit of a logjam in the front court. But I don't really think they do. The concern from some people seems to be that, oh, Laurie Markkinen at the three full-time is going to be a problem. Can he play there full-time at the three? I think that problem is very, very overblown and just shows and exposes the people, quite frankly, that didn't watch Utah last year. Uh, because Laurie played at the three in Cleveland and looked good, to my surprise. And I feel like people forget that Kelly Olynyk was starting next to Walker Kessler for the majority of last season in Utah. Laurie was at the three for most of last year, and now they just think that John Collins is at the four and they forget that Kelly Olynyk existed. Lori has been a three for the last two years. Lori will continue to be a three next year, and that's not a concern. They have five guys in the front court, Kelly Olenek of which is the fifth, and that's fine because his defense is the most worrisome. His spacing is fine, but Taylor Hendricks is going to come in and replace that to an extent, probably not to the same level, but to an extent. And five front court dudes is very much a fine number to have in your rotation. I think Utah are more than fine in that situation. And Lori Markin at the three, again, is not a problem. He was there last year. The biggest question outside of that, as we've mentioned multiple times, is the point guard position. Uh, who's the long-term answer? That remains to be seen. Is it Colin Sexton? And if so, can he stay healthy and continue to improve as a playmaker? Is it Taylor Horton Soccer, who's still learning the point guard position, but has certainly shown some upside? Jordan Clarkson obviously could be there for a little bit too, but long term, he's not the answer. He's not fitting the timeline for that. So the point guard position is the biggest question for me. They have Kessler at the five. They have Collins and Hendricks at the four. They have Laurie at the three. They have Agbaji and Keontae George at the two. There's a lot of young options at those positions or high end options at those positions. The point guard position is still a little bit more in doubt. Uh, but that'll be the interesting thing to see throughout the course of the season and is maybe something to look to address next offseason, potentially in the draft. Ultimately, I really like what this roster looks like. I really, really like their front court. I think Lori Markkinen is going to come back and have just as good of a season next year. I don't expect a significant drop off from him. And given the amount of depth they now have on this team, although it is very young at some parts, I expect this team to be competing and be right in the mix for the playing tournament again next year. And I'd like the Rods to be in it. I think this is a very young team that's going to play with a lot of energy, a lot of motivation, a lot of drive, and a very high motor night in, night out. And those are the types of teams that when it gets down to the nitty gritty can get you a couple extra games in a regular season and get into a playing tournament. 
I would not be surprised at all to see Utah get themselves in there, especially if Laurie Markkinen plays as well, especially if they get some good production from the rookies, if John Collins can start to revitalize himself a bit, and you get some improvements from a guy like Walker Kessler, a guy like Oche Agbaji. I think they're in a great spot moving forward. I really like their future heading into the next season and beyond. And ultimately, I expect them to be very, very competitive again next season. Once again, only one year into a rebuild where they traded two all-NBA caliber players.